Let me add my uh, welcome to those that you've had from everyone else this morning. It's great to see all of you here. Um, it's great to see all of you who are usually here and wonderful to see many visitors. I assume friends and family of those who are regular attenders, and so we thank you and welcome all of you. The Lord is no more here today than on any Sunday, uh, and yet we get the opportunity today to focus on the risen Lord in a special way, and so we're glad that you've chosen to spend a few minutes with us. We have, uh, we'll be reading or, or be uh, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, since you've just been standing, uh, we'll let you sit for a moment, but 1 Corinthians 15, uh, and I want to read beginning in verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. This is the reading of God's infallible word. Let us pray together. Our Father, we are grateful for the word brought to us, Father, through great uh, suffering and pain many times in its original inspiration coming from you, brought down through the ages and translated at the cost of many lives into our own language. It's been a costly exercise that we could lay multiple copies of it on our end tables and on our coffee tables and uh, sometimes never look at it. Forgive us for our negligence and our apathy. Restore to us, Father, the sense of your presence and the sense of the greatness that belongs to you. Lord, we'd be remiss this morning if we didn't pray for those who have illness or sickness in their families. It seems like we've been hit with an epidemic of cancer and other physical disabilities. And we're asking you, Lord, by your grace and through your mercy to bring healing, physical healing where necessary, spiritual healing, relationships, healing of relationships. Lord, we're all wounded in one way or another, and we pray for your healing touch. But in the midst of praying for your blessings, we pray that we will most of all, treasure the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing ever takes you by surprise. Nothing escapes your notice. Nothing is missed. And we want to love you more than we love your blessings. We want to treasure you more than we treasure the things that you give. And so we pray that you will... Help us this morning, Father. Hide the messenger as we look at this passage and help us to see, help us to see the risen Christ in all of his glory this morning. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would guess if we went around the room this morning, we'd find that every one of us could say, yes, I have had a life-changing encounter at some point in my life, right? For me, one of those happened in February of 1956. We had just moved from a farming community near Columbus, Nebraska. 
we heard Jim Kennedy was going to be born, and we thought we better get out before that. Uh, just kidding, wherever Jim went. But uh, uh, we left Nebraska and moved to Hutchinson, Kansas, and we were still in the process of unloading all of our belongings out of the truck when Frank Gordon made his way across the alley from where he lived to the home where we lived, and with him he brought a catcher's mitt and another mitt and a baseball. Took about two throws, and my life was changed forever. Baseball has been ever since at the center of what my interests are. First, in the younger days when I could play it, and now when I can keep up with what's going on in the world of baseball. It's been an enjoyment that the Lord has given me that probably was worshipped as an idol at some point in time in my life. Too much enjoyment, but in its proper place, I trust now. It was a life-changing encounter. But as great as that encounter was, it can't hold a candle to the encounter that I wish and pray and plead for everyone who is here this morning. And that is an encounter with the person of the risen Jesus Christ. Believe me, nothing in life or in eternity can hold a candle to having an encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus. You know, in this passage of Scripture, Paul is going to tell us about the personal encounter that he had with Christ. He prefaces it by the most succinct statement of the gospel that's found in the New Testament. In verse 3, that Christ died for our sins. If you think Jesus died for any other reason, it was all a mistake, that it was a tragedy of history of some kind, you must think again. He died willfully, purposely for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. You got a guilt problem? We all do. The good news is, Jesus died and rose again in order to bring us life and forgiveness and cleansing from guilt. But the question is, have you met him? Do you know him? See, it's not automatic that we get the life that has been made available to us. At some point, we have to meet and have an encounter with the risen Christ and say to him, I give you my sin in exchange for your righteousness, and I thank you for what you have done for me. Paul's going to give us an account here of his encounter with the risen Christ. He met Jesus in person. So can we. I realize that Jesus is no longer walking the earth as he did 2,000 years ago. The Bible assures us that he is here, present in the world, in the person of the Holy Spirit, whom he said he would send as soon as he left. The Holy Spirit who points people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit who affects that life-changing encounter when we meet Jesus and when we choose for him that Holy Spirit is here. And the new life that he brings and the lifetime of companionship with him is like nothing else that you can ever have. That surrender to Christ can be just as life-changing for us as it was for Paul. So I want us to see four ways in which the encounter with Christ brings change. First of all, we see that in Paul's life, the risen Christ helps he helped him to see himself differently. The risen Christ helps us to see ourselves differently. A number of people, at least 500 at one time, saw the risen Christ physically when he was still here on earth, right after the resurrection. But there was one more encounter that happened after he had ascended back to heaven to be with the Father. It was the encounter that Paul had with him and it was very physical. He says in verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now Paul says that was, he, he says, I was untimely born for a simple reason. Paul lived during the time of Christ, but he never saw him in the flesh for whatever reason. He 
was therefore untimely born. The appearance that he had was untimely because Jesus was no longer physically on the scene at that point in time. But boy, what an appearance it was. I want to look at it quickly in the ninth chapter of Acts. So if you're in 1 Corinthians, just turn back past Romans into the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 9, we have an account of this encounter that Paul had. Paul was born, as most of you know, by the name of Saul, living in Tarsus, which is in north of, north of Palestine in what would be today modern-day Turkey. He was born in Tarsus, but he was sent to Jerusalem and educated among the, mo the most uh, elite of the educa educated people of his day. He became a devout Pharisee. His father was also a Pharisee. As a Pharisee, just like the other Pharisees of his time, or most of them anyway, when he heard that Jesus had been put to death, he, th he thought, well, that's good. That's the end of that. He was certainly no friend of Jesus. He was no believer, although he had heard about him. In fact, he became the greatest enemy of the early church, of the other early believers. He was seeking out followers of Christ to imprison them and to kill them and to try and stop this movement that he viewed as being all wrong. By the time we get to Acts chapter 9, he had asked permission from the high priest and gotten permission to go to Damascus because he had heard that there was a group of believers there. I mean, that's a pretty zealous person, right? He's going way out of his way to do something that he doesn't have to do. But his whole point is to go to Damascus to root out the Christ followers and to bring them in chains to Jerusalem. That was his plan. God had a different plan. And he is about to have a life-changing encounter with the risen Christ that he didn't believe in. So we pick up in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 3. It says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Wow. How would you like to have that happen? Most of, our, most of us don't have a life-changing encounter with Jesus that's quite as dramatic as this. But, beloved, we can have an encounter that's every bit as much life-changing. For Paul, this was the start of the most dynamic ministry of any Christ follower in history. I think it's pretty safe to say. Paul was a master of understatement when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared also to me. That's a pretty understatement of what actually happened, as we've just read in Acts chapter 9. With that, switch flipped. As Jesus appeared to Paul, Paul began to see himself differently. He says in verse 9, back in 1 Corinthians 15, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. You have to understand, that is totally different than the way Paul looked at himself before this, right? Before this, Paul looked at himself as the best of the best. He didn't know anyone who was better than he. He didn't know anyone who tried harder than he. In his view, he was as close to flawless as he could get. He tells us about that later in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, he kind of gives us his resume, if you will. And he says, here's how I saw myself before I came to Christ. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, meaning I was with the chosen people, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul saw himself as pretty good. He thought of himself as someone who was going to work his way to God, and he was doing well in his view. He, he viewed himself as a hero for persecuting the church. But as soon as he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, that whole thought had to go up in flames, right? He saw that what was so good in his mind was abominable in the eyes of God. His pride took a huge hit 
things were not the way he thought they were. He was now seeing reality the first, for the first time, and it was different than the fantasy that he was living out. And so Philippians 3, 7, he says this, but whatever gain I had, whatever gain I had, and he had it stacked up to here, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Well, that's a whole different view of himself than he had before, isn't it? Things changed drastically. Paul saw himself now for the sinner that he was. He even saw, here's what's important, I think, beloved, to understand. He didn't just see that his sin was wrong, that his sin was bad in the eyes of God. He saw that his good was not good enough. He saw that even his good was not the thing that was going to get him to heaven. He saw that his good was not the thing that would make him acceptable to God. He understood that it wasn't just his sin, but it was everything about him. And he saw that he was going to have to choose. He was either going to have to choose the flawed, the good but horribly flawed intentions that he had, or he was going to have to choose the perfection of Christ. And thankfully, Paul chose the perfection of Christ because he saw himself for the lost soul that he really was, despite of every advantage that he had. Well, this is step one for anyone who would have an encounter with Christ. We have to see ourselves for who we really are, right? We have to see that not only is our sin sin, but we have to see that our goodness is sin in the eyes of God. We have to see that our goodness is loaded with selfishness, Paul says that he was unworthy to be called an apostle, but guess what? So was Peter. So was James. So was Andrew. So was Matthew. So was all of them. There was no one worthy in the group that followed Christ, and there's no one worthy sitting here today. Romans 3.10 says that no one is righteous. No, not one. Paul goes on and says there's no one who seeks after God. We may say we do, but we seek after a God of our own making. A God made in our own image. A God who will do what we ask him to rather than a God who does what he chooses to do. We must see ourselves, beloved, for who we really are if we're ever going to come to an encounter with with the wonder of Christ. The first thing we have to understand is that we are not worthy of him, but at the moment we see that, we will understand that he has been worthy in our place. This is the good news of the gospel. <clears throat> when I finally see myself for who am I, I, I really am and understand that I am unworthy, I begin to see that, oh, but he was worthy. Thank goodness he was worthy. Thank goodness he came in order to be worthy. We have to understand that no matter how good we are, we cannot be good enough. Would God have really sent his own son to the cross if there was a possibility that somehow I could be good enough to do this on my own? But neither can I be bad enough. If we say I'm too bad to come to faith in Christ, then we're saying that the crucifixion of Christ was only, would only go so deep. And I would ask you, so where's the bottom? We can't be too good and we can't be too bad to need Christ. We all need Christ. So the first discovery we must make is that we... unworthy. I love a story I came across one time about a, there was a prestigious church in London years ago, and it was associated, it became associated with two other churches in London as well. They were in different areas of the city, a couple of them in pretty desperate areas of the city, but each New Year's Day or as close to New Year's as they could get, New Year's Sunday, they would come together, the three churches would come together as one. And they would celebrate communion together. One day, the pastor of the larger church noticed as they were celebrating communion that there was a judge from the city that was kneeling at the communion rail. They had the communion rails in those days. And he noticed that right next to him was a man who had been a prisoner for years. In fact, it was the same judge who had sentenced this guy to seven years in jail because he was a thief. And there they were, kneeling side by side at the communion rail. And he thought, well, that's kind of an interesting picture to see there. He knew that the man that had been the thief had come to faith in Christ at one of the other churches. 
He had uh, heard the gospel and he'd given his life to Christ. His life had changed and now he was involved in that other church. And so there they knelt, the judge and his convict. Well, as he was leaving church that day, he happened to be walking close to the judge and they got talking to each other. The judge said to him, did you see who I was kneeling next to at the communion rail? And the pastor said, yeah, I, I saw. I didn't, I didn't think you saw, but I noticed it was that guy that you, that you sentenced years ago. And the judge says, yes. He said, what a miracle of grace. And the pastor said, yeah, that, that man is a marvelous troth, trophy of grace. Coming from his background, imagine how God has saved him. And the judge says, oh, no, I wasn't talking about him. And the pastor was confused. He said, what do you mean you weren't talking about him? Who are you talking about? He said, well, I was talking about myself. He said, yourself? How could you say that? And the judge, this, this is a remarkable insight, but the judge said this. He said, you know, I came from, think about this. I came from the best background you can come from. I, uh, I was sent to church from the time I was early. I was taught right from wrong. I went to church faithfully. I read my Bible faithfully. I was taught to, be, to live a moral life. I was given the example of people who live moral lives. I was around people who did things right. He said, I went to school at Oxford and graduated from there. He said, I became a judge. I mean, he said, think about it. How could somebody that had my background come to see themselves as a hopelessly lost sinner? But I did. Only by the grace of God. He said, when that man came to faith in Christ, he and everybody else around, knew him, uh, around him knew that he had nothing to offer. He said, it took the grace of God to convince me that I had nothing to offer. He's right. He was right, wasn't he? Until we see ourselves as those who will, are in need, we will never come face to face with Christ. We will continue to be the self-righteous sinners that we really are until we see ourselves as God sees us. It's not that God doesn't appreciate and love the good that we do, but, beloved, it's because he sees to the bottom of it. He sees to the core of the black hearts that we all have that are absolutely ridden with selfishness, if nothing else. We all need a Savior. but We will not see him until we see ourselves differently. Second thing, the risen Christ will help us see God differently. The risen Christ helps us see God differently. Prior to his conversion, Paul's picture of God was pretty simple. He saw God as just a righteous judge who was up there just waiting for him to do something wrong. He believed that he had to earn his way with this God. And so God to him was this, was this great judge in the sky just waiting to strike him down. He pled his goodness. He was doing everything he could think of to ingratiate himself to God. All the while, knowing deep down it really wasn't good enough because deep down we all know that. Paul was reminded, I'm sure, often of Leviticus 11, verse 45, where it says, You shall be holy as I am holy. Wow. You don't have to meditate on that verse very long to realize I think I fall short of the glory of God, right? I can't quite make it. As hard as I try, every good intention I have somehow within the week is messed up. When Paul met the risen Christ, he got a whole different view of God. He saw a God who, yes, demanded the standard that said, you must be holy as I am holy, but he for the first time saw the Christ who died for his sins and who, in fact, really was alive, like those apostles were saying, therefore validating all the claims he made that says, I will come and I will forgive you. And so he saw now a God who, who what the, he saw that what God demands, God supplies. Isn't that wonderful? God is still the holy God who demands perfection, but what he demands, he also supplies, and he supplied it through Jesus Christ. Paul got a whole different view of God when he met up with Jesus. He saw that what God demands had already been provided for him by Christ. He could not work his way, but the work had already been done. 
That's a wonderful discovery. To discover that the God who demands is also the God who supplies is critically important if we're going to meet the risen Christ. It became crystal clear to Paul as he saw the risen Christ that God is not only holy and just, but God is also infinitely loving and merciful and gracious, right? Great discovery. One doesn't do away with the other, but they both work together. And so Paul says in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 15, look at this. He says, by, this is a wonderful statement, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He doesn't say, by the good works of me, I am what I am. He'd figured out that the good works of him wouldn't take him very far. So he's, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace that sent Christ to pay the debt for Paul's sin on the cross. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is undeserved, unmerited, amazing grace. Paul got it. He says in Galatians 3, in fact, maybe we should just look at that because we'll Take a couple of these. If you're in 1 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians and then Galatians, and you're right there. Galatians 3. Paul wrote about this in detail throughout the book, but in Galatians 3, verse 10, we have this section. It's the beginning of a section that is so clear on what the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. Here's what he says. Galatians 3, beginning in verse 10. He says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Curse is just another word for meaning you're on your way to hell. That's what the biblical word curse means. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Paul knew that by experience. He'd been there. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. See, what Paul understood is if you want to be, sa- be saved by keeping the law, all you got to do is be perfect. That's all you got to do. You can do that. If you're going to be perfect in thought, word, and deed, you can save yourself. Good luck. Right? Paul understood that. He got that now. All you have to do is be perfect. So that's why in verse 11, Galatians 3, now it is evident that no one is justified by God before God by the law. The righteous shall live by faith. See, Paul got it that the law was never given in order to save us was never given so that people can be saved by keeping the law. The law was given to show us you can't save yourself. So you need something else. Then when you get that something else, the law is given to show you how to live. But it was never given to save us. Beloved, it can't save us, right? The law can't save you. No one is justified before God by the law. And so verse 13, so Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do that? By becoming a curse himself. If you don't think the Bible teaches substitutionary atonement, you don't believe anything about the Bible. It's on every page. How do we become right with God? Because Jesus took the curse that should have been ours. What Paul is saying in his passage of Scripture is very simple. The penalty that we earned, he got... And the righteousness that he earned, we got. Right? That's the message of the Bible for those who will come to Christ by faith. His resurrection only proves what he'd been saying all along. So my question this morning is, do you know grace? Do you know the God of grace? Have you met this God who has done this for you, who has sent his son to be your To make the payment for your sins, do you know him? Have you committed your life to him? It's not what we can do for God, beloved. It's what he's already done for us. Revel in it. You know, I mean, meditate on it. Think about it. This is, this is the story of the Bible all the way through. This is the story of the flood. It's about grace. This is the story of Abraham who asked to sacrifice his Isaac and then God stepped in by grace. This is the story of Jonah and the, and the people in, 
Nineveh. This is the story of the Hebrew children. It's all grace. It's grace, grace, grace all the way through. This is, you know, this is what Martin Luther discovered. Martin Luther is doing, you know, he was a monk's monk. There wasn't anybody. You know, Paul and Luther had so much in common because they both had the background where they were doing everything they could think of to save themselves. Everything. Martin Luther wore out his confessors because he'd go in there for hours at a time and he would confess every little thought and every little deed and everything that would come into his mind. And Martin Luther came to do exactly the same thing that Paul did. He came to hate God. Why wouldn't you hate God if he asked you to do something that you can't do? He said, I hate God. Until he discovered the passage that said, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's what Martin Luther discovered. That's what Paul discovered. Paul says in Romans 8, 7, for the mindset on the flesh, that means my efforts to be good, the things I'm doing to try and earn my way, the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Why? Because it can't. It can't. But in Christ, Luther found the solution. Luther found, as Paul found, that Jesus paid it all. And that the sin that he could not overcome, the sin that the moment he stepped out of the confessional, he had another thought in his mind that he got to go back in again. This was Luther's life. This was Paul's life before Christ. But when he finally found Christ, wow, he saw something completely different. He came to see God differently as someone who had given not only the demand that's up here, but someone who had also provided the solution that's up here. All by grace. Jesus said it this way in John 17, verse 3. He said, this is eternal life. What? That that you'd be better than the next guy? Is that, is that what it says in John 17, 3? I know you're not looking at it, but you know it doesn't say that, right? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And how do we know you, the only true God? And know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's how. Faith in Christ. He's a loving God, beloved. Yes, he demands. He has to. It's just within his character. But Paul could now say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Not by my goodness, but by his. So the risen Christ helps us see ourselves differently. He helps us see God differently. Thirdly, he helps us see life differently. He helps us see life differently. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 10, middle of the verse, he says, In his grace, the grace of Christ, his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. See, when Paul met the risen Christ, you know, he saw himself differently, saw God differently, but he saw life differently. Life for him before had been one long exercise in trying to get right with God. It had been one long exercise in trying to be good enough in spite of the fact that he knew he really couldn't be good enough. It was a selfish endeavor to get himself right with God even if he had to kill other people to do it and he was willing to do it. That was his life before. What a life, huh? Now he sees life differently. He can even say that he worked harder than any of the other apostles. Why? Because what's his life now? His life is to share the life-changing message of the gospel. Jesus is enough, that Jesus is sufficient, that Jesus is the only way. And he can say he worked harder than any of them. He, and he's not bragging. He's just saying that though he was untimely born, he's made up for lost time. I think Paul could honestly say, you know, we know from some of the passages that he wasn't always supported by somebody else. He often worked, you know, at tent making at the same time supporting himself as he spread the message of the gospel of Jesus. We don't know if any of the other apostles did that, but we know Paul did. 
We know that Paul traveled more miles than any of the other apostles. I think he probably spoke to more people than any of the other ones. He preached, preached more. He wrote more letters than any of the other apostles. Paul could honestly say, and he had suffered as much or more hardship than any of them, by God's grace. But he did it, he did it, beloved, not because he was trying to earn his way to God. Now he did it because he loved the God who had saved him. Right? He loved him. He wanted other people to have this same opportunity. His life changed. Life changes when people meet Christ. Has your life changed? Can you honestly look back and say, I'm different than I used to be? You know, it may not, your occupation may not change, your location may not change, but what will change is your orientation. It has to. If the Holy Spirit has truly come within, your life has to change. Christ followers are no longer living for themselves. They're living for Him. That's what a Christ follower is. If that's not true of you, don't claim to be a Christ follower. You're not. Tell me what your dreams are and tell me how God fits into them and I'll tell you whether you're a Christ follower or not. Is your career just about making money, making a nice retirement for yourself and going down to Florida and playing softball and counting seashells? Isn't that the example that John Piper gave, right? Here, Lord, here's my seashells and my softball games. Is that what your life is about? Really? Really? I'm not saying you shouldn't retire, and I don't care if you go to Florida, but somewhere in there, there has to be the, 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 the idea that I'm, I want to live this life for, for Christ. I want to see other people come to know Him. There's a new orientation in an old career when you come to Christ. See? Things change. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Christ, the old me is gone. The old me is gone. The new me lives for Christ by faith. His goals are now my goals, even as I do my work as a teacher, as a lawyer, as a farmer, whatever it is. His goals are my goals. His interests are my interests. His Purposes are my purposes. Life changes when you come to faith in Christ. Has your life changed? I've used this illustration before, I know, but it fits so well. You know, and our small group, uh, our leader was lazy on Wednesday night. And so he said, uh, why don't we go to a movie? And uh, it's, it's, it's Rob. In case you don't know, I want to point him out. He said, let's go to a movie. And so we went to a movie. We went to see The Case for Christ. It was a wonderful movie. And what really wasn't because he was lazy. It was because he thought we might benefit from it, which we all did. The Case for Christ, which is the story of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was a Harvard-educated legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. Hard-drinking, carousing man. Profane. When his wife announced in 1979 that she'd come to faith in Christ. In the movie depicts a little bit about how that happened. But that was, Strobel was thrown for a complete loop. He thought he had lost the best thing he had. The fun, Leslie, he was sure was going to be gone. But it started a skeptical Strobel on a two-year jihad, really, to prove that the resurrection wasn't true. Because if he could prove that, he could get his wife back. That was his view of life at that point. So he spent two years going around the country and the world interviewing the best people he could find, some of them atheists, some of them agnostics, some of them true biblical scholars, to try and sort out what is the real historical record about the resurrection of Christ. And every time he came up with the indication that Christ was resurrected, he tried to disprove it, he would come up with another evidence that Christ really was resurrected. I dare say he spent a lot more time at it than any of us here have, right? So you could read the book and get the benefit, the case for Christ. But here's what he concludes. He says, on November 8th, 1981, I realized my biggest objection to Jesus also had been quieted by the evidence of history. 
The tables had turned. In the face of this overwhelming avalanche of evidence in the case for Christ, the great irony was this. Listen to this. It would require much more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to trust in Jesus of Nazareth. This was not just anybody. This is an atheist who had every reason to conclude differently, and he came to the conclusion that it was all true. He gave his life to Christ. But here's the part I want you to get. Life changed for Lee Strobel when he gave his life to Christ. About five months later, his little six-year-old daughter, Allison, came to her mother and she said this, she said, Mommy, I want God to change me like he did Daddy. Let me ask you. If we ask your husband or wife or your children or your parents this morning, have you seen a change in so-and-so since they claim faith in Christ? What would they say? Has there been a change? You know, here's the deal, beloved. The Holy Spirit truly comes and lives within those who come to faith in Christ. This is the teaching of the Scripture. If any man claims to come to Christ and has not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his, Romans 8 9 tells us. And the, the Spirit of God comes with certain fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, all those things. Are those, do those characterize your life? Not perfectly, but and we all start at different points. You know, some of us start at almost perfect. A few, right? Maybe. I don't know. We think we do. A few of us start right back here in the middle, and a few of us start way over here. It, you know, so the question isn't, are you over here where this guy is to start with? But the question is, how far have you moved from where you started? You can't be the same if the Holy Spirit is living inside. You can't. It's impossible. Life changes when you encounter Jesus. Fourthly, the risen Christ helps us see truth differently. The risen Christ helps us see truth differently. Now, we, I, I'm fully aware, I run into it every day, that we live in an age which does not believe in absolute truth anymore. We are relativists. Absolute truth is out. Relativism is in. You can have your truth, and if it works for you and makes you feel better, great, good for you. Why don't you go down that path? I have my truth, and it works for me. And the fact that those are diametrically opposed doesn't bother anybody anymore. You, go, you take your way, I go mine. See, but it, it, do you see that the question is wrong? The question isn't, does my truth work for me, and does your truth work for you? The question is, what works for God? Right? God's the creator. God is the governor of the universe. God is the one to whom we will all be accountable. So the question isn't, does it work for you and does it work for me? The question is, does it work for God? And the risen Christ is the proof that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? There isn't any other way. So Paul concludes in 1511... He says, whether then it was I or they, others who preach, so we preach and so you believed. Preach what? The gospel. That Christ died for our sins. That he rose again. He was buried and then he was raised on the third day. That, see, that's rock bottom, absolute, universal truth. Jesus died for your sins and then he rose again to prove that it was all true. That's truth. And it isn't a question of does that truth work for you or does it work for me? It's a question of does that truth work for God? And the answer to that is yes, and it's the only truth that works for God. There are not multiple roads to God. There are not multiple truths. All roads don't lead to the same place. I know that's what everybody wants to say. I can only tell you according to the scriptures, it's wrong. All roads don't lead to the same place. The good news is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. Jesus told Pilate, you know, Pilate sneered at him. He says, yeah, who are you? 
what are you doing here? Jesus eventually looked at him. He said, I'll tell you what, Pilate. I came for this purpose. I was born to do what? To bear witness to the truth. According to Jesus, there is the truth, not a truth. Why he came. So the question is, have you met him on his terms? According to his truth. A Russian lady was new to the United States. A friend took her on her first shopping trip. And if you haven't been with somebody who lives lived behind the Iron Curtain, it's a it's kind of a treat. I've had this happen a number of times. Anyway, this lady took her friend to the store, first shopping trip, and the lady looked around, and she was just, she was dumbfounded. And she just stopped, stock still, you know, and the friend said, what's wrong? And she said, she said, I, 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 she said, I don't know what to do. She said, she said, there's nothing wrong. It's just that with all of these things out here, how do you decide what you want? How do you decide what to take? Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're asking this question. Given all the religions in the world, how do I decide? And isn't it true that they all lead to the same place? If that is your experience this morning, I have one question for you. Just one question. Where in all of human history do you find a person who spoke like no other person ever did with divine authority, who did mind-boggling divine miracles as a routine thing every day, including raising people from the dead, someone who claimed to have died for your sins because he had lived a perfect life, and then that same person rose again. Where in all of human history do you find that? One place. Jesus of Nazareth. This is not Muhammad. This is not Joseph Smith. This is not Zoroaster. This is not Confucius. This is not Vishnu. There's only one place where you find this and that's why there's only one way of salvation, beloved, and that's because there's only one risen Christ. So you don't have to go up and down the aisles and examine everything and make a lot of... You just need to go find who's the one person in human history who has, who has not only claimed but then demonstrated victory over sin and death. Where is that? Jesus. I'm going to conclude a little bit longer than normal conclusion, but I trust it'll be worth it. It's a story. Josh McDowell went to the same seminary I did about five years ahead of me. Hated his father, who was the town alcoholic. All of his high school years, his friends would joke about Josh's father. He would join them in the joking, laughing on the outside while he was crying on the inside. It got, it got so bad that Josh used to go home, find his mother so beaten in the barn that she couldn't get up without help. It got bad enough that when he was in high school and he was big enough to overpower his dad, he would actually go out and he would tie him up in the barn when he had friends coming over because he didn't want his friends to see his dad. He'd hide the car, tie up his dad, do whatever he's doing with his friends and then let him loose later. That's pretty bad. Hate his dad. In college, this atheist, as he claimed to be at that time, met up with some friends who were Christians. And they talked for a while, and he certainly wasn't going to budge in his position, and they weren't going to budge in theirs, but they finally said, look, Josh, why don't you do this? Why don't you investigate the resurrection of Christ? Everything in Christianity hinges on that. Paul himself acknowledges it just later in the chapter we're reading when he says, if Christ is not risen, our faith is vain. It all hinges on that. That's the pivotal point. Why don't you go study that? And Josh said, I, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And he was the same as Lee Strobel. He took off to do that with one purpose in mind, which was to disprove the resurrection. 
he went to libraries all over the country, and in fact, later on, by the time he got done all over the world, the evidence that he compiled was extensive. He eventually compiled it in a best-selling book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you haven't seen it, you probably won't want to read through it all at once, but it's a great reference book because it has everything you can think of in terms of evidence for or against the resurrection of Christ. But it convinced him, the evidence convinced him that there was a resurrection, there had to be a resurrection. There's no other explanation for what's happened in history. There had to be a resurrection, and it led him to faith in Christ. Gave his life to Christ. Still hated his dad. But the Holy Spirit was inside now, right? The Holy Spirit, whose fruit is love, joy, peace, all of those things. And so here's his testimony. He says, about five months after I made that decision for Christ, a love from God entered my life so powerfully that it took all that hatred, turned it upside down, and emptied it out. I was able to look my father squarely in the eyes and say, Dad, I love you. And I meant it. He said that really shook him up. A few months later, Josh got into a major car accident. He was in the hospital for a number of weeks. One of the days when he was in the hospital, his father came to visit him. It was on a sober day, so it was a good day. His dad came. He was very shaky. He was very unsure of himself. Really didn't know what to say to this son anymore. But he came and he finally, as he was pacing the room, Josh says, he said, son, how can you love a father like me? So Josh says, well, let me share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. I can love a father like you because a Savior could love a man like me. He said, I have placed my trust in Christ, received God's forgiveness, invited him into my life, and he has changed me. God has taken away my hatred and replaced it with love. I love and accept you just as you are because of him. Again, his dad didn't know what to say. He went away. He said he came back about an hour later, and his dad then said, Son, if God can do that in your life, what I've seen him do, and if God can do in my life what I've seen him do in yours, then I want to give him the opportunity. I want to trust him as my Savior and as my Lord. What a miracle, right? If you think the encounters with Christ are just for those in ancient times, beloved, let me assure you, it's for now. It's for now. Josh goes on to say, he says, usually after a person accepts Christ, change is slow. I think many of us could relate to that. Sure, but slow. He said, in my own life, the change took about 6 to 18 months, but the life of my father changed right before my eyes. It was as if God reached down and flipped a light switch. Never before or since have I seen such a dramatic change. My dad touched alcohol only once after that day. It got as far as his lips before he thrust it away. There's just one conclusion. Relationship with the risen Christ changes lives. It can change yours too. Do you know him? Have you accepted him? Have you invited him to be Lord? It's not automatic. See, you have to want it. You have to ask for it. You have to humble yourself before him and invite him in. But if you do, he will. And if you do, he'll change you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for the striking evidence of history for the risen Christ. And now we thank you for the testimony of person after person after person in this day and time, in this 21st century, as to the power of the risen Christ to change lives. Pray right now that if there's anyone here who's never invited you in, this might be the time when they would say, oh Lord, I, I get it. I don't know how to do this. But as best I know, I just say, I, I see myself as a sinner. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse my heart, take away the guilt, 
make me your son or daughter. You've said you'll do that. You've said it, Lord. You said it. As many as received him, to them you gave the power to become the children of God. You've said you'll do it. We trust you now to do it for those who will open their heart to you. Thank you for this time, and I pray that our reflection will be of value, not just now, but for eternity. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.